This whole diorama build was way more trouble than I expected it to be, but god dang if I'm not happy with the way it turned out. Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. This bad boy diorama is complete and I'm really thrilled about it. There were a lot of challenges along the way, but I think they were all entirely worth it for me to accomplish this goal of building my first 75 millimeter scale diorama with a subject matter that I really, really enjoy. If you missed last week's video where I made the majority of the base, be sure to check that out. I will link it above in the info cards. This week, I was able to focus my attention on Zombie Man himself, get him all painted up, all gory and bloody, and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. And I'll share with you guys how I got there. I had to do a little prep work before I could paint this model, and most importantly, I needed a way to hold him. He's a big boy, and I didn't think just putting him on a handle with some sticky tack would be sufficient. You really needed a peg of some kind. So with a lot of caution and a bit of worry about ruining his foot, I drilled in a small hole so that I could embed a toothpick. This was especially tricky because the zombie model, well, he has a big chunk of his calf missing, which meant there wasn't a lot of material there, and I had to be really careful not to drill too deep and poke a hole through it. Once I had that hole successfully made, I used some five minute epoxy to attach him to the toothpick. I would have preferred to use a metal rod for this, but I didn't have one and well, you work with what you got. I could then securely attach him to a large pill bottle that would be a lot more comfortable to hold throughout the process. For primer, I just used cheap aerosol spray primer. I first hit it with black and then followed that with a zenithal highlight of white from above to help me see all of his little details. This would also, in theory, give me some undercoat highlights as long as I was able to keep my layers of paint thin enough for them to show through. While this method is amazing when followed by airbrushing on some inks, I personally still haven't managed to get a good handle on using it when brushing on paint. It's a lot harder to keep them thin enough for this effect to work, but each time I try it, it brings me a little bit closer to understanding the process. I debated which route I wanted to go with his color scheme and aesthetic. Would I go for a realistic rotten flesh look or more of a comic book style? Since I really wanted to pay homage to the classic zombie films of the 70s and 80s, I decided on more of a comic book style. I wanted this piece to look more like a movie poster for a Fulci movie or like Creepshow or something like that. I didn't really want it to look like a modern horror. For this reason, I decided to base coat all the flesh in an olive type green rather than any variety of human flesh. Unfortunately, while I waited for that to dry, I realized something that made my heart sink. The area of the base I struggled with for days last week, again, looked terrible. Apparently after sitting for a few more days, the sculpt mold and milliput shrunk just a tiny bit more, causing visible lips and an indentation in my base. I was seriously devastated, but I had to make it right. This meant more coats of joint compound, which would later need to be sanded and painted, but this time on a piece that was totally finished and flocked. But I really needed this thing to be finished and I needed it to look right when it was done, so I sucked it up and I made the effort to fix it. On the plus side, once the green was dry on the zombie, I was really excited with how the actual model was looking. But the flesh was the easy part. I had to move on to his clothing. I pictured him wearing the remnants of a very old fashioned tuxedo, black pants, white shirt, and like a red cummerbund belt thing. Every one of these elements would be difficult for me and my skill set. Painting black fabric is really, really hard to pull off. Painting dirty white fabric is also hard to pull off. And a red belt next to his guts pouring out without just getting lost and mixed together visually would be nearly impossible. Regardless, I moved on to painting the pants. Initially, I grabbed a gray, which I instantly realized was way too light. So I switched to an actual black with the goal of slowly building up highlights of gray. But something weird was taking place. The black paint was acting very strange. It almost felt like it was having a reaction to the previous gray. It was an oil and water type situation, and I really wasn't expecting that. It sort of seemed like I had thinned the black too much, but I really hadn't, and the Vallejo paint I was using is notoriously thick. 
I really couldn't figure it out, but I pressed on. When it dried, I noticed that the Vallejo black was actually super glossy. Perhaps this was the reason it seemed to repel from everything? I don't know. Either way, this gloss effect would not work for me. I didn't want it to look like he was wearing PVC pants at a goth bar. So I put on another coat of black. This time I switched to Reaper paints and I didn't use a pure black. I used one that had a little bit of an undertone of a very dark purplish brown. This worked a lot better, the paint was more matte, but it still seemed a bit off. I figured, heck, well, I'll move on to the shirt for a bit. I wanted it to look white, but really dirty for obvious reasons. My plan was to paint it all out a creamy white and rely on some washes for the dirtiness. Since white covers notoriously poorly and it would end up looking pretty dirty anyway, I thought a base coat of khaki would be appropriate. I'm not convinced this was the right approach, but it's what I did. I followed that up with some highlights of the off-white color. Again, not sure this was the right approach, but a big reason for wanting to try a model of this larger scale was to give me some more room and experiment and learn on at a size that was easier to see what I was doing. And while it's true that it's easier to see what you're doing at this scale, it's also true that it's a lot harder to make things look good, as there's also a lot more area to show poor technique, poor blends, brush strokes, and just sloppy application. As I painted out his ribs with an undercoat of white, I realized another challenge that I would face later, and that it might be hard to distinguish the ribs from the shirt. I continued out painting his visible bones in white, however, in the hopes that I could differentiate it somehow from the shirt by using different washes or finishing effects. As soon as I applied some red to his belt, I knew this was a mistake. There would just be no way to make it not look like more spilling intestines coming out of his belly as it was right next to them. I could possibly do the intestines and guts in more of a brown and decomposed state, but I knew I'd inevitably end up with some sort of blood effects there. So I used that red instead just on the guts and not the belt. And when painting out his innards, I decided to mix in a little bit of dark brown just to tone down that bright red. Just a little bit. I really wanted that belt to stand out though, so I opted for a very high contrast color, a really vibrant blue. This may be a bit too bold of a color choice in some people's eyes, but it's a choice that I'm happy I went with. At this point in the day, it was about 2 p.m. and my troublesome hand tremor that I deal with when painting got the better of me. I realized I hadn't eaten yet, I was a bit stressed out and worked up about the base problem I faced earlier, and I had too much caffeine in my system on an empty stomach. I really needed to take a quick break to remedy all of that. And while I enjoyed my delicious but very late breakfast, I reflected on how cool this model was and how much I really wanted to do it justice. So this seems like the perfect time to discuss the maker of this model and the sponsor of this episode. Lude is a company that creates very detailed miniature STL files for at-home 3D printing, and they created this amazing zombie. By joining as a monthly member, you get access to a different set of heroes, monsters, and scenery every month. And this month's theme is all about the graveyard. Zombies, whites, skeletons, ghouls, and all sorts of cool graveyard accessories. The models are all supplied as pre-supported files ready to print, making for a really convenient experience. They also offer up files in both 32mm gaming scale and 75mm scale for display painting. And I decided to use this month's theme to try my hand at my very first large scale diorama build. But you might want to take all of these cool zombies and skellies and print out a horde of enemies for your RPG, or maybe a little warband for your favorite skirmish game. There's also a few epic white models this month that would make for killer big bad evil guys in your ongoing adventure. The monthly fee is only 15 bucks, so you get a ton of value out of it. In addition to the themed bundle of the month, you also get a huge welcome pack when you first join up that's full of awesome tavern themed miniatures. Each month brings a new theme to the table. Last month it was goblins, this month it's all undead, and if you want to get these cool undead models, well you'll have to join up before the end of July. And I'm sure you're going to want to stick around for whatever cool theme they use for August. Either way, you're going to get plenty of useful models for gaming, 
painting, or, well, diorama building. Lude is just a wonderful company that makes really nice models that are an absolute pleasure to work with. So a sincere thank you to Lute for sponsoring multiple videos on this channel now. I was especially grateful when I told them, listen, I wanna spend two weeks on this thing to do it right. And they were willing to help me out with that and sponsor a second one. So thank you, Lute. I really highly recommend all of you go check them out. I'll put a link in the video description below. With a full belly and a more relaxed attitude, I got back to work on Little Zombie Man. The last remaining part of the model needing base coat was the hair. I wasn't sure what to do here. He couldn't have beautiful golden locks and it just wouldn't make sense. But I also didn't want everything on this model to be a super tonal dark black or brown. I considered trying to model his hair color after our friend Goober. But in the end, I settled on kind of a grayish brown. At this point, I was feeling a little skeptical about whether or not I'd pull off a nice finished piece. I really thought I was failing this model. It just wasn't looking right. I know from experience that throwing a wash on a model often takes me from the, oh, this looks like crap I should give up stage and pushes me into the, actually, you know what? This is gonna be okay, I can do this stage. So I moved on to some washes. I ended up using Agrax Earthshade for basically the whole model, the shirt, the hair, the pants, the skin, and even the guts, the blue belt, and the bones? So yeah, actually not basically everything, but literally everything. Thankfully, this did pull things together just enough for me to have confidence to continue. I thought it would be a good idea to put a bunch of effort into the face, which is the most important part before doing the rest of the model. This way I would avoid doing it when I was possibly burned out on painting. And I think this was a really wise decision for me. At this point, I was relaxed and excited. This meant I could take my time building up highlights in a fairly detailed fashion, maybe put in a little more effort than I normally would. I slowly layered up the highest points, working into lighter and lighter shades of green. But instead of just using white or a tan to light lighten up the green, I experimented using a really vibrant yellow. This was a move I was really glad I made. I think it resulted in a really nice comic-like effect that I was really content with. Feeling confident, I moved on to highlighting the shirt. This should have been easy given all of the great texture on the sculpt, but I really struggled with this. I just couldn't manage to get it to not look off. The white highlights on a dirty shirt just didn't look right. It's a weird thing trying to highlight something that is white, but also supposed to be dirty. I don't yet quite understand how you're supposed to do it. So I just uh, applied another layer of brown wash. This in combination with the extra highlights below did provide a reasonably decent look, thankfully. I wanted to do better on the pants though. Now, dark fabrics, especially blacks, are notoriously difficult to paint. Highlighting black to bring out details often just ends up making things look gray or beige or dark blue or whatever tone you use to highlight. I messed around for a while on these, slowly bringing up highlights of a gray with a bit of a purple undertone. Now this did result in a color changing effect, but I was okay with it as I really wanted to bring out those fabric fold details on the model. And while doing this, something really wonderful happened. I started to highlight the model with more of a stippling technique and I really liked the way that looked. Doing some dotted streaks rather than going for smooth blends made it look more like fabric to me, but more importantly, it gave it a really great comic look. It looked illustrated. I want to say this effect is sort of like when people paint a model to look cell shaded, but I'm reluctant to do so as my technique here is very amateur, but I do feel like it's the start of understanding that style and it's a style I really love. So I doubled down on it and continue to use that technique on the rest of the model. For me, this was the real magic moment in the process. It was a step that required a fair bit of effort and time, but because the effort was actually paying off and because I was really happy with the effect, and dare I say proud of it, it made it easy to spend a lot of time on it. It made it fun. I probably spent a good two hours going over the model in this fashion, and I gotta say, I thoroughly enjoyed every single minute of it. I think this might be the magic ingredient for me to find a painting method that I enjoy enough to really put a lot of focus into learning to do it well. So basically, I'm thrilled I accidentally landed on doing this style while painting the zombie's pants. 
With the paint job at a place I felt comfortable leaving it, I moved on to the final fun detail, the bloody goo effect. And I wanted to coat the intestines and organs spilling out from his belly with some glossy wet slime. For this, I used UV resin as it cures really quickly. I like mixing in some color to this stuff and I found that something about the Citadel contrast paints reacts to the resin in a strange way where it never fully mixes like an acrylic paint does. This separation creates a result that I think looks far better and more realistic. So I mixed in some of the bloody red as well as some brown and green so it looked more like rotten bodily fluid rather than fresh blood. Using a sacrificial brush I applied it to oh well all the appropriate areas. On the exposed bones I used this very sparingly just enough to create what looked like a thin layer of blood and rot. This turned out pretty great. When it came to the actual entrails, I went crazy with it and just fully covered in as much as possible, just slopped it on. For around the mouth, I mixed up a little batch of resin using only the dark green. And I used a mixture of both that green stuff and the red stuff kind of together to kind of slop it on wherever his flesh was pulled away from his bones. This resin cures via UV light. And you can just use a little UV flashlight for this, but I have a nail light that I use for curing prints, so this was a far more convenient option. The light is also a lot brighter, more powerful, which is important when curing resin that has pigments mixed in, as those block some of the light needed for curing. I cured this for a few minutes to make sure it was really good and hard. After that, he needed a few strands of blood and drool. So I used some small strips of cured resin to accomplish this. This process is a little bit finicky, but it's well worth the time. And I think considering all the effort I put into this project, it was definitely worth it. Let's not forget that pain in the butt base though. <sighs> man, I can't, oh man, this thing was just, <sighs> With that fixed, again, I could finally put Zombie Man in his little world. I clipped away the toothpick, leaving about a half an inch to act as a pin. That in combination with a little bit of glue would permanently attach him, doomed to roam the graveyard for eternity. Of course, I had to do a little bit more touch-up work with the dirt flocking around his feet as well as on the edges where I had to do all those repairs. I thought he should probably have some dirt on his clothing, given the situation. But I didn't want to go overboard, so I just settled on doing a tiny bit on his pants, and I think that was the right choice. With the exception of all the trouble I went through on the exterior of this base, this project was an absolute pleasure to work on. I've said a few times that I enjoy doing dioramas more than making terrain, so it was really nice to spend two full weeks doing one. I'm also really glad that I took my first jump into a different scale. When doing a diorama, there's really no reason to be constrained to 28mm gaming scale. With a 3D printer, I can print models of basically any size I want. This is a really liberating concept for me and I look forward to playing around with more dioramas at different scales in the future. For this, utilizing a pre-supported and pre-sized model from Loot was the perfect way to jump into this and again, if you're interested, I highly recommend you check them out. I'll put that link to their site in the video description below. So what do you guys think? Personally, I'm really proud of this project. I'm really glad I tackled it. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. Let me know in the comments below. I sincerely hope you enjoyed sharing this journey with me and I really hope that you've learned something for yourself along the way. If you wanna pick up any tools or supplies for your own hobby needs, be sure to check out blackmagiccraft.ca. There I list and explain the things that I use regularly so you know what the heck they are and where to get them through the links that I provide there. If you enjoy these videos I make every week and you wanna help me keep making them, the best way you can do that is by supporting the channel on Patreon. If you get a lot of value out of these videos I make, if they have brought you a new hobby or a new activity that you know is great for you and your family, or maybe if they've helped you save some money, throwing me a couple bucks a month helps ensure that I can keep providing them for you and the community at large. You can help me help, help, you know. Zombie Man is done. I'm gonna find a place to put him on display permanently. My daughter, who is terrified, she's five and a half, she's terrified of zombies. I hid this project for, from her while she was, while I was working on it, and uh, she finally saw it, and she told me that it wasn't scary. So I'm a little bit disappointed in that, but I think he's cool nonetheless. Okay, guys, I'll see you again next week. Cheers.